Russian forces are already claiming to have beaten Ukraine's counteroffensive. It's a little early to be claiming victory, but just why are they rolling out every single piece of footage of destroyed Ukrainian equipment? And we're going to break down whether or not this is really meaningful for this counteroffensive. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's June 10th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get right into it. Okay, first, let's take a look at the control map. And we finally, after two days of relative silence, have a small update. We can see the areas where Ukraine has been pushing, or at least in succeeding in its counteroffensive. One is here near Lobkove. Uh, you can see, again, crossing this river and dislodging Russian forces from this tree line and forested area here. Um, you can see if they can get beyond this, um, it is a rel there is fewer defensive positions that they will be able uh, that Russia will be able to occupy. Um, trenches in open fields like this, where you can't manage a defense in depth, are much harder. Um, of course, urban areas are still sort of tough nuts to crack. As we look to the uh, east, you can see the next area where there's substantial changes is actually right here. There's reports of uh, Ukrainian uh, forces liberating um, Levadne uh, and more significant progress uh, being reported near this uh, line of villages right near Blahodatne, um, Neskuchine, and Sotorovshev. <laughs> These names are, are, are hard for an English speaker. Okay, but what I want you guys to take away from this is first, that it's almost certain that Ukraine's vision is to march down this string of villages here um, along this river. Uh, while this may not be a great plan for heavily mechanized forces, um, it may be favorable terrain, especially if they can occupy these heights above these villages. Uh, if they can maintain uh, control of these hillsides looking down onto the river, then it's go they're going to have an easy time dislodging uh, Russian forces as they move south into Zaporizhia. Um, and of course, I believe there's maybe one more place. Nope, I think I think that's largely it. Um, these are three locations where we've seen substantive changes so far. Now, bear in mind this was updated right as of. Uh, 7 a.m. this morning, so fairly recent. Um, when we look over at the control map, uh, we can see that uh, there's very few there. This map is really trying to maintain operational discipline, operational security um, by not revealing much of anything. Um, there is some interesting data, right? If you were on the live stream yesterday, you knew that a lot of people were talking about Tokmak. And Tokmak seems like it would be an important military target, um, both because of the Tokmak airbase um, and also because it is a hub of a number of rail and roadways, major roadways, uh, that really control access to other parts of this um uh, northwestern corner of Zaporizhia. Uh, being able to control some of these roadways would actually potentially disrupt resupply operations for Russian forces fighting at the front. Um, incidental to that, Ukraine uh, is going to have to push to, seems like they want to push towards Raptine, and again, hopscotch through these villages, um, eventually getting to Takmak. Now, clearing an urban area is a tough, tough mission, and it's not clear that... Uh, it's not immediately clear that it would be behoove Ukraine to actually clear block by block through this. They may find themselves better served trying to encircle and cut off parts of the city, either using ground forces or, as you're seeing here, using um, indirect fire, missile strikes, whatever tools are available. So I think that is illustrative. But what I want to point out is that Russia is still pushing on the offense, especially in the Eastern Front, 34 combat engagements um, across from really from north of Bakhmut near Solodar all the way down to Marinka. Um, <laughs> though it's worth noting that Ukrainian forces are continuing to push in Bakhmut as well. There's even some reports that in the southwestern part of Bakhmut, uh, Ukrainian forces have actually begun to take back parts of the city. Um, if you're curious, 
Uh, there's been a lot, a lot of ink spilled in Russian media spaces about the destruction of Bradleys and Leopards. And no doubt, uh, I think it's absolutely true that Ukraine is rolling out its Bradleys, its Leopards, uh, its uh, NATO provided main battle tanks and infantry fighting vehicles in this phase of the counteroffensive. Now, what I want to point out is when we go over to War Mapper, Actually, first, I want to real quick shout out CombatVetNews.com. If you haven't become a member, um, this is where all the viral uh, combat footage, the GoPros, the drone footage, including drone footage of the actual destruction of this uh, Leopard tank and Bradley convoy that's received so much attention from the Russian and pro-Russian media. Um, I did a breakdown of that on the this week's, actually yesterday's, uh, members only video. If you want to support the channel, support what I do, become the 1% of viewers who are on here, who are members, um, any one of these tiers will get you access to the members only content. Um, and that's where you can see the deep breakdown of this particular incident. But what I want to point out is when you look at the way Russia has arrayed its forces in Zaporizhia, you can see that, uh, these, these, um, here we go. These darkened, uh, dark red spots represent known Russian fortifications. And you can see that Russia has broadly constructed really two defensive lines um, around the Zaporizhia region, right? You can see there's Robtine, uh, and then another defensive cluster in this southern part of these villages. That's probably the main line. And then finally, you have a uh, heavy fortifications around Tokmak, literally encircling the city. But as you guys can see, if Ukraine can seize Tokmak, then it's going to control some key rail yards. Um, and east of Tokmak, there's no defense works. If they can seize this, they can drive eastward across the city, de uh, just decimating Russian supply lines and cutting off these all of these defense works. So getting behind the, the trenches, so to speak, is a key component, a key to victory for Ukraine, right? If they can get behind, break these trench lines in any location, they can presumably start to wreak havoc in the backfield. And it's going to be really hard for Russian forces to be on the defensive, both because all of these trenches, I mean, right? Imagine you're in a trench like this, and suddenly instead of the enemy coming at you from forward, they're coming from the side. You don't have any pre-planned fires. You don't have any of your machine gun nests set up to face that direction. And because you're in a, tr a linear trench, uh, there's um, you can't even bring massed fires to bear. So this is the core, the core goal of this offensive. And as I pointed out that it's going to come in two flavors or it's going to be in two equally challenging halves. The first half is going to be the initial five, I'd say probably five to 50 kilometer push into Russian territory. And the other half of the offensive is going to be the remaining 200 plus kilometer push all through this backfield. So I point this out because a lot of commentators are like, wow, they're losing uh, leopards already. One, what did you think the tanks were for? They are not museum pieces. And I understand that the United States in the past several wars, particular maneuver battles they fought in Iraq and Iraq uh, in the you know Gulf War, um, the U.S. tanks took comically few casualties, but this is not the norm for armored warfare. Uh, the norm is that you build very, very good quality equipment and you try to make the enemy take much more, many more losses, uh, than you. Um, but you do not, you do not operate with no losses. Tanks are destroyed. Uh, this is just part and parcel to this operation. And if you have to lose, you know, if you have to lose dozens of tanks to break the enemy's lines, this is what the tank was invented for. In World War One, the very first tanks were meant to do exactly what Russia is doing now, or what Ukraine is doing now, which is providing a uh, a strong, decisive, fast-moving spear that breaks enemy defenses. This is what the tank is meant for, and inherent to that uh, is, of course anti-tank uh operations that's it's inherently a risky role um 
and these tanks and the tankers that operate them um, are this is this is why people talk about you know the courage and this is this is why tankers are seen as a unique group within the military there's special tanker boots special tanker units they have tanker traditions it's very very um idiosyncratic because their job is hard and it's difficult and it doesn't look like anyone else's so understand that Early in this conflict, you are going to see casualties. This is not the last time you will see uh, NATO provided main battle tanks uh, becoming casualties, becoming destroyed or, or, or mobility kills or whatever. And Bradley's it's going to happen more. It's probably going to happen in increasing frequency as Russia more as more and more breakthroughs happen and more and more Russian forces struggle to uh, lock down these lines. So. I, I just feel the need to point that out because it's become such a propaganda point and it's so silly. Um, you have to also remember, again, these aren't NATO troops. They didn't, they haven't had two years of tank crew of tank training, right? They it's measured in months. So you're not going to see highly advanced tactics. And again, I break this down in the video on combatvetnews.com um, th that they don't, use unsound tactics a lot of people are looking at a video of uh what appears to be a bunch of bradley's bunched up and the short version of it again i can't show it here because of youtube's terms of service they're they're not really fans of uh any war content honestly um but the reason i say it i bring this stuff up is because the it, it, it looks like vehicle recovery operations, right? If you have to recover a crew, recover a, a downed vehicle, you're going to have, you're going to inherently have to bunch up or else you're going to abandon your vehicle and its crew. You can't do that. And so, you know, Russia, of course, is going to release some footage. And, and I've called it out. I've said we're good. I've watched Russian footage where good tank crews uh, have performed well doing vehicle recovery and still gotten caught in artillery fire. You can tell the difference between a good tank crew and a bad one. Um, so all of this to say, you know, uh, and I know there's going to be a bunch of Russian trolls in the comments that are like copium. But again, it's not copium because I call I, I call it when Russia does it too. When Russian tankers do well, I say these Russian tankers are doing well. And this is this is the reality of war, guys. Uh, you know, in, in Call of Duty, you know, if, if or in, when you're playing a first person shooter and you're like, uh, you know, a, a, a gold three or a platinum tier player and you're fighting a bunch of, I don't know, bronze tier players like you'll go, oh, it's normal. Of course, I should get 50 kills and, and, and no deaths. War doesn't work like that, guys. Uh, you could be the greatest tank crew of all time, but um, a anti-tank mine with an IQ of zero um, can eliminate you if you just get unlucky. That's it, guys. It's luck. Um, random dumb luck in a lot of cases. So understand that this is an inherent part of war, and your goal is just like a good gambler. Your goal is to weigh the deck. Um, understand that there's going to be some random chance, um, but you want to be able to skew the odds in your favor through whatever means you can. Um, one other note I want to point out is that again, the, uh, <laughs> right. The, the Institute for the study of war, uh, really, uh, is pointing out that the Russian information space, again, just absolutely losing their minds over this damage and destroyed, um, Western provided equipment, uh, and you know they're like praising their forces. I I don't like institute for the study of wars like dismissal. Listen, Russian forces are executing effective defensive operations. Like no kidding. Um, in Bakhmut, they didn't. In Bakhmut, they look like they have kind of collapsed and been pushed backwards repeatedly. But it's not so in Zaporizhia. These these guys are fighting effectively. Um, this is warfare. Uh, so. Yeah, just bear in mind that this is 
not indicative of any everything is going to plan probably maybe even for both sides both sides may believe that things are going okay and we don't yet know who is really going to come out on top so that's all i had for you guys thank you as always for being fans thanks to all of the folks at combatvetnews.com especially our new lieutenant tier members our colonel tier members i appreciate you guys so much um and I will see all you guys in the next one.